The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, open the word of truth to Romans 14, verse 5, and uh, page 4 of your notes. Romans 14, 5. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is what we call the rebound technique. And the rebound technique enables you at any time, under any circumstances, to name sin to God, confess to him, and you are instantly forgiven. The first two adjustments to God do not require works. Salvation is not by works. It's not, it's not even by faith plus works, even though there are people who are saved who are do, thinking they have to do things in order to do maintenance on their salvation. All you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ. What did the thief on the cross at, on Jesus' right do? He believed in him. At the dead end of his life, suffering along with Jesus and his buddy in crime. They put thieves on either side of Christ. It's called the albatross treatment, guilt by association. <laughs> It doesn't work, you know, but uh, th that whole scene has these uh, two thieves, they called them. They weren't just petty thieves. These were uh, violent guys. Romans didn't crucify someone for shoplifting or, you know, that. No, this is, this is, these, these, these were violent Jewish criminals. Anyway. They were ragging on Jesus, and finally the one on his right told his friend to shut up. This man hasn't done anything wrong. We're here because we have done something wrong. It's like he became enlightened under the most unusual circumstances, and he turns to Jesus and he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. So he had a real short phase too. But he did, he did what he, he, the little bit of time he had left in that miserable condition before the Romans came and hurried up their death because of Jewish scruples of being on a cross on, on the Sabbath, uh, they came by and, and uh, with big mallets and broke the bones in their upper legs and they expired real quick. But Jesus was already expired. And uh, Jesus died uniquely. I'm talking about his physical death. He died uniquely. He tapped into his deity. He told his disciples before the cross, no man takes my life. I lay it down and I take it up again. <laughs> so when you're dealing with the life of Christ and things he says, He'll either speak exclusively from his, uh, uh, the predicate is his deity, or exclusively his humanity, or both. That's the trick. Only he could do that. When he said to the Jews, before Abraham was, I am. They said, you're just, you're not even 50 years old. What are you saying? That was his deity. And when he said on the cross, I thirst, that relates to his humanity. Deity doesn't get thirsty. Deity needs no externalities to support deity. All right. So the second adjustment, there are no works involved either, except the difference between it and the salvation adjustment, it needs to be repeated over and over and over because of our predilection to sin, sins of cognizance and sins of ignorance. Oh, I didn't know that was a sin. Well, he came to Bible class, figured out it was. 
So you identify the list. The, second the third adjustment requires works, intake of doctrine and application. As is in the book of James, faith without works, divine good, is useless. To use a, an extreme illustration, if you believed everything you ever heard but you never made any applications, well, what good is that gonna do you in terms of eternal reward? You have to apply doctrine. You have to apply it to your daily living and your situations. That's why we have these doctrines to help you to understand how to, how to work your way through situations so that whatever you do during the daytime is a regular deal. You can do it as unto the Lord. And you do it, in, and that's how you do it in fellowship. I have to stop all the time. Oh, am I in fellowship? It, it could be just an ordinary chore, anything. Get yourself in fellowship. Well, I'm going to go shop for groceries. Get yourself in fellowship. Offer up a quick prayer. Bless my efforts. My shopping basket. It's in the Bible. Let's take the usual time to prepare ourselves. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again that we can assemble ourselves together and fulfill the royal imperative to grow in grace and knowledge. Bless this Bible class to that end in Christ's name. Amen. Example number two, special days. One person regards one day above another. Uh, one regards one day, judges, it's the word crino, which means to judge in this case, regards one day or judges one day <clears throat> above, the preposition para, another day. Another <clears throat> regards every day alike. Uh, uh, regards every uh, day, the word day is himera, uh, alike. That's an adjective, uh, idios, alike or alone. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. Each one, kastos, person, must be fully convinced. The word Convince, uh, this, is a, this is a command, a present passive imperative, a plero for repo. It means to convince, to be convinced fully of something. 100%, you're on top of it, you, are, you understand it. You know, there's no shaky ground on it. You got it clear. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord. And he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. He who observes the day, the word observes is pronao, the present participle. Uh, the day with a definite article, whatever it is, observes it for the Lord. And he who eats does so for the Lord. For he, this is the, the believer that's on top of things, for he gives thanks, eucharisteo, to thank, he gives thanks uh, for, excuse me, here, it, and uh, he who eats not, that would be the weak believer, as in our previous study, and he who eats not, for the Lord, he does not eat, and gives thanks to God. So this is very interesting, uh, dealing with these issues here. Excuse me for just a minute. Uh, I got my notes twisted up here a little bit. All right, let's do the analysis of these verses. Just hang in there with this one, because this, this one you know, had me going too, uh, trying to deal with all the nuances and things involved here. But anyway, Paul presents yet another example of the religious scruples of the weak believer. Some in the Roman church attached sanctity to certain days. And we're not told this couldn't possibly be pagan holidays. I can't even imagine, Paul would have criticized that because that's within a context of that which is false. It almost has to be 
uh, people who are or are under uh, a Jewish influence in their pre-salvation days. Uh, could be a proselyte to Judaism where they observe the weekly Sabbath, the seventh day, the day of rest. By the way, that did not become law until Sinai. The fact that God had ceased from his work on the seventh day uh, following the restoration of the earth does not mean it is a command. Yes, it is smart for people to take time off rather than be a workaholic. That's, that's intelligent. But it did not become law until the Jews were in the desert under Moses. And they got, they kind of, they, they, they kind of got a pre shot of it because God's got, God, in order to feed uh, my approximation based on the number of males that were 20 and up, that's when they considered you to be an adult, uh, it was 603,000 plus that walked up out of Egypt. That doesn't include women and children and some, and some people that were non-Jewish that saw all the plagues and said, you know what? I think I'm gonna identify with the Jews. They're called the mixed multitude from different nations around because everybody, it was like every, all the nations around heard about all this. They, they couldn't have missed it. They didn't have to have TV or radio or anything. All they had to do was say, whoa, we went to Egypt uh, to buy something or to, uh, to trade, and guess what happened? And, they, and so, that, so this, the news of the judgments on Egypt, the 10 plagues, and the exodus out of there, and of course, uh, the big headline at the end was the complete destruction of Pharaoh and his army at the Red Sea. The nations knew about it. And as Israel was moving through the land, uh, through, through that uh, peninsula towards the promised land, the Canaanites were very nervous. But anyway, what I was gonna say is, there's a logistical problem. You got two million people and they're on the move. How do they know when to get up? And they, move, and they moved according to their tribes in an orderly, not a mob fashion. They had to, or it would have been chaos. And they had a cloud, a supernatural cloud over their head. When the cloud would move up, raise up and go, they'd get under it and go. The cloud also provided them protection from the sun, shade in the daytime. At night, it exuded a nice ground light, not harsh, but a nice light so they could move around in the evening because they're in a wilderness and there's no food out there to speak of. So what are we gonna to do to feed them and water them? They need lots of water to clean stuff up and to drink. And that rock that's on that picture on the bulletin board that split, it's right over there in Saudi. It's five, I believe, it's either three or five stories high. They had one picture of a man standing down there in it. That's the rock Moses hit. He didn't hit some big boulder. He hit, like, like you see out west in places if you've traveled, here's a lone rock standing up like this, all by itself. That rock, the rock that Moses struck, and it became a supernatural fountain. Water came up out of it, and by the way, that rock, those that visited said, it's smooth, as if, if water runs over rocks for a while, it'll smooth them out. We all know that, I think. So that's where they got their water source while they were, for the year they were at Sinai. The food was manna, a special white substance that came down out of the sky in the evening, and you better get out and get yours before the sun wrecked it. In the, in the early morning hours and get enough for each family. And so on days, what we would call Sunday through Friday, six days, on the sixth day, they got a double portion and they were told and they're given instructions. 
Don't take home more than your family can eat. And some of the dummies did, but they only did it once because this stuff went foul in their tents and stunk to the high heaven. Can you follow instructions? And this manna was easy. See, so they had, they had this food and it, 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 for all ages, it just took care of everything. It's a superfood. And it came down out of heaven and it's a type of Bible doctrine, spiritual manna. And, but on Saturday, nothing came out of the sky. Some dummies went out looking for it on the first occasion, but then that was over. Whenever they, they, whenever they do that, it would tick Moses off. Here God is providing for you in an environment where you can't raise cattle, you can't plant crops, you're on a march. And, you, and, these are, and this is how they were fed for 40 years until they entered the land under Joshua. And there was a day in which it just stopped like it had begun. And so the seventh day, they weren't gathering manna. And it was easy to prepare in their tents. There's a couple ways and there's some recipe about how they fixed it. You say, well, I get tired of it. Really? It's a superfood. You don't have to work. Ladies don't have to go out and shop. You don't have nothing. Just hand it to you. The, seven, the sixth, seventh day, they had no manna. This was a preparation for the giving of the Mosaic law in which you shall keep the seventh day holy and you don't go to work. You don't do your usual stuff. You just stop. Now, the Jews, the Orthodox Jews, I assume, uh, they, they, they uh, attach a significance to certain days. This difference of opinion falls into the same category as the food issue, point four, point five. This is apparent by the fact Paul returns to the subject of food. Six, the background to regarding, uh, the regarding of certain days as holy is based on the ritual code of the law. Unless there's something going on that I don't know about. We live in the church age. We're not under the ritual code, okay? We're not under that ritual code. We're not Jews living in Israel under the code. The church age has a new set of marching orders and it has very few rituals. Water baptism and the Lord's table. That's, about, that's it. So the observance of days you say, well, there's Christians out there that observe days. They're not, they're not told to. They can't find a verse in the Bible that says, celebrate the birth of Christ or celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Of course, Christianity, uh, a lot of them, they've mixed this with paganism. That, that, that's Easter. People don't even... People say, Happy Easter. They don't even know what the word means. It's the anglicized version of Ishtar. She's the Babylonian fertility goddess for crying out loud. So if you say Happy Easter, you're saying Happy Ishtar. <laughs> that the joke's on all these people. And what are the other symbols uh, in that holiday? eggs and bunny rabbits. They're fertility symbols of the pagan world. But hey, come to church and let's do an Easter egg hunt. There are no holy or set apart days in this dispensation. The closest you can get is Sunday, the Lord's day, we come and assemble and take in doctrine, have a double session. But if you want to go home and mow your yard, you're not violating working on the Sabbath. Christians took, well, except for uh, uh, the, uh, the certain cult types that, that still observe Saturday. It's not authorized. So we're, we're, we don't have that over us. 
So we understand that, just like with the food thing. Everything is legit if you give thanks. If you forget to give thanks, you have, you've taken three or four mouthfuls, I've done that before, more than once, and uh, you stop, oh, okay, sorry, I confess that. Uh, thank you, Father, for this food, sanctify it to my body, bam. You don't have to go on a big, long prayer. You know, like you go to somebody's house and they're praying on them, droning on, come on, let's eat. Make it short and sweet. You're thanking God for the food, sanctify it to the nourishment and health of our bodies. Boom. That's all that's required. Really. I mean, if you want to mention something else, that's fine. So the strong at Rome recognized that this ritual observance had been set aside with the coming of this, the church age. Eight, the believer who observes one day over another is again the weak believer. That believer's conscience is not mature in this area yet. He just hasn't. Because when you, when you get ingrained with things like this, it's hard to just move on for some. For some. Such a believer did not understand the change of dispensations. 11. Paul as in the case of the food issue, exercise tolerance towards the weak. Don't, don't bully them. Let, them. let them work this out. Give them, give them space. They need, not, they need to be given time to grow out of their misconception about days and diet. It takes time for some people, longer than others. It just depends on the nature of the individual. Because Bible doctrine changes your life. It changes your outlook. It changes your thinking. You conform yourself to it. And that changes you inside and so forth. And it, does, it do, doesn't happen overnight. There's no quick course. The command of verse 5 requires that each believer be convinced of the truth before, God, before the believer drops his legalism. That's another point. The weak believer isn't just to jump up and do, if he can't do it by faith and have a relaxed mental attitude, and he's, he's loaded with guilt when he's doing it, he shouldn't be trying to eat certain foot meat or whatever it is. He should wait until, we'll give you a verse on that later, I will later. They need time to grow out of their misconception. Uh, so observance of days was tolerated at Rome at this time. Okay, if you want to, if it was if it was the Sabbath thing, and you uh, tried to conform to that day as, and hold it in your mind as a special day in the week, okay. Well, fine. We're not going to make a big issue out of it. You got to grow up. Observance of days in Galatians and Colossians is strongly denounced as it was tied to false teaching. That's a different context. The weak sincerely observed special days and did so as under the Lord. They were in fellowship. They're observing this, whatever it was, uh, not, not pagan, you could, that couldn't possibly be it. The pagans had special holidays. One of their big ones was Saturnalius. That's the one that is at our so-called Christmas time. And what did they, and so when, when pagans began to be Christians, they, they said, well, we like that holiday. Uh, we like feasting and putting greenery on our, in our homes and on our doors and exchanging gifts. Sound familiar? And so certain religious types, Christians, said, okay, and we'll celebrate Christ's birth on the 25th of what we call it, December. Really? As, one, as, as somebody would told me, they, 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 I read that they had a professor of, of, of ancient history at OU. He drops this bombshell on him. He said the Romans would have never done a census in the wintertime. <laughs> See, people had to travel from, if you lived here, you had to go to do this census. You had to go to your, your birth home. That's why, Mary, that's why Jesus and Mary weren't going down to Bethlehem. 
They couldn't just do it up in Nazareth. And that's where Jesus was born. And it wasn't on the 25th of December. It was on the first day of the Jewish New Year. And the first, and the Jewish New Year isn't January 1. It's called, and they have names for each of their months, the month of Tishri. One Tishri, which also, uh, and that, that was the first day of the year. And whenever a new king took over in Israel from his father, that's the day they crowned him. It's called the Feast of Trumpets. And Jesus was born using the, our calendar, 9-11, 3 B.C. So they all run around celebrating his birth, all his months off. They got it. Everything is so messed up because traditions, the traditions of men take over. And we're not told in the Bible, uh, you need to, oh, you, uh, you can celebrate the birth of Christ anytime you want to and rejoice in it. Best way to celebrate is to study the infancy narratives. Look at the detail. The fun is in the details. That's where it's fun. Anyway. Um, the weak sincerely observe special days, note, and did so as unto the Lord. They're to be left alone. Give them their space. This is the strong believer eats as unto the Lord. The proof being that he offers thanks to God before each meal. And I don't care how humble your meal is. I don't care if it's a quick uh, sandwich, whatever, you know, just quickly thank God for it and move on. Thanksgiving sanctifies the food before us according to 1 Timothy 4, 4 and 5. And that, of course, I gave you that one. That's the... Uh, um, get it here. This pretty well lays it out. Everyone else has the Bible like I do. Here it says it. For everything created by God is good. So if people are you know, like John the Baptist uh, grinding up locusts and making some kind of a meal or substance out of them. Well, whatever it is, everything created by God is good. God has created all of, and nothing is to be rejected if it is, to re, if it is received with gratitude. For it is sanctified by means of the word of God, which says you can eat that, and prayer. Again, you have complete freedom in this area. There are no restrictions. I mean, you may have health restrictions. I'm not talking about that. But otherwise, a normal person with normal condition can eat whatever they want to eat. So there's a verse for you. So if you have run into any people with these kind of scruples, it's not that, that at best would be a weak believer. The weak believer can eat in fellowship when he offers thanks. God is giving him time to grow up. He can still be in fellowship and have his food fetish or his day deal. Paul is giving him this time and, the, and showing him this grace. He does, he doesn't, he doesn't sh shy from telling everybody what is the right way to go. The right way to go is with the strong believer. Now, treat each other appropriately. We don't have that problem around here that I know of, anything like that. Never heard of it. Yes, people celebrating certain days, uh, but as a result of my growth, uh, to me, the cleanest one is Thanksgiving. <laughs> Really, it's the cleanest. There's, they, don't, they haven't attached, a, 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 I mean, it implies we're thankful to God for this bounty. And yes, it's violated with overeating and all the stupid stuff, but still, it's fine. I don't have a problem with it at all. 
You don't have to celebrate it if you don't want to. I've been in people's homes since I've been on doctor and my parents, they did the big deal with Christmas. When they lived out, when we'd go out and visit them in the Chesapeake Bay area of Virginia, we'd go out there, we went out there a few times, my wife and I, and had the tree up and all the stuff, you know. Okay, I can do that and still be in fellowship. I, in my own soul, know that, you know, this God hasn't required this of us. And the decoration of a tree uh, has, has certain pagan connotations. It's in, in the book of Jeremiah, in the temple. They were, putting, they were putting silver stuff on these trees. There was nothing in the Bible told them to do that. And then, you, and, then you, and then you can go to lie to your little kids and tell them there is a large man in a red suit up in the Arctic Circle that flies around and drops gifts on good kids. Oh, really? And, and you know how children buy this. I know, I was, I was little once. I, 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 put out the, I put out the food for him. You know, I, I never once in my life thought, how could he eat all this? How could he get here? How could he, in a, in a short time, give, drop gifts on everybody? But it, they inculcated it in me because it was fun for the parents to see the child running around and saying, my dad got up on the roof one Christmas Eve. And that's when I was really young and I had a little stick horse that had bells on it. He got up on the roof and shook that thing, it sounded like bell, went ho, ho, ho. My mother said my face went white because you weren't supposed to be up and Santa wouldn't come. And I'm screaming for everybody to jump under the covers and shut the lights off. His mother was there, my dad's mother was there at the time, and she really chewed him out for playing that dirty trick on me. But I eventually figured it out. Because I wasn't a church going, no, they weren't atheists, but we just didn't go to church. So I had that. So I determined I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie to my kids. It's harmless. No, it isn't harmless. It isn't the same as watching a Bugs Bunny cartoon. We all know that that's made up. When we were kids, we never thought Bugs Bunny was, well, I don't know of anybody, thought he was real. It's a Hollywood or whatever it is, Disney deal. We know that. But the Santa Claus thing, St. Nick. Likewise, the weak believer can eat in fellowship when he offers thanks. Being weak does not mean a believer cannot eat as unto the Lord. All right. We go to the bigger picture. That's what I entitled these two verses. You got notes? You, nobody got notes, right? You got no more notes, right? Is that right? That was my failure to not hand these out. I thought, I thought we had, uh, what do I got here? Oh, I got, I got notes, but you don't. They're back in the church office. My bad, you can forgive me. I wasn't paying attention when someone says, you want me to put the notes out? I thought I had more. I said no. All right, you get to go early today. Thank you, Father, for the time. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us in Christ's name. Amen.